Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, I'm announcing the public release of a major GitHub source code project that can be used to create some amazing LED-based projects. If you're interested in C++, LEDs, Arduino projects in general, or the ESP32 in particular, there should be something here of interest to everyone. The project itself is called Night Driver, and its purpose is to provide light shows on LED strips and matrices. After a few examples of how the project can be used, we'll dive right into the C++ code and I'll take you on an introductory tour of the GitHub project. I'll try to tell you everything you need to know to go from zero to hero with minimal frustration so that you can get the code up and running quickly. My goal is to give you the information that I wished always somebody would have given me when I first started working on a project, like how to set it up, how to install the needed parts, build the code, upload it, test it, make my first customization, and so on. I plan to show you every step along the way, as well as taking a deep dive into the C++ code itself. Night Driver can be configured to achieve a wide range of effects and applications. For example, in the form of a single long strip that can be up to about a thousand pixels long, it can be used to create a hidden year-round effect strip that hides under your eaves. If you needed more than a thousand LEDs, multiple units can be chained wirelessly and synchronized. Now, Christmas effects come to mind, obviously, but you can also do NFL game days in your favorite team colors and even have a fireworks show on July 4th. When configured to control four strips at once, one simple use is in constructing the Atomic Tiki Fire Lamp. In this implementation, I bought a simple hanging lamp from eBay, gutted it, turned it upside down, and replaced the white LEDs with individually addressable LEDs connected to an ESP32 running the Night Driver code. This project also includes a microphone and remote control, both of which are fully supported out of the box by Night Driver. The code listens to the room audio, builds a complete spectrum analysis, and then makes all of that audio data available to the LED's visual effects. That means that the arms of the lamp can respond to the room audio and music. Responding to music can be taken even further because Night Driver includes beat analysis code. Here's an example of a set of five glass insulators responding to the music in the room. It's one of the demo projects included with Night Driver. Upping the ante to eight strips control at once, we have the Tiki Fire Umbrella. It provides more than a dozen effects, including sound reactive effects for your music out on the patio. All you need are an umbrella, eight strips, an ESP32, a suitable power supply, and the Night Driver code. If you owned a bar or a hotel, for example, you could sync the effects to all your umbrellas, remotely turn them to special colors during your drink specials, and so on. Better yet, if writing effects in C++ down on the ESP32 isn't really your thing, the project also supports a simple Wi-Fi format where you can run your code on the PC or phone and then send the color data compressed over Wi-Fi to the ESP32. It then draws the results live on the LEDs for you. That means you can write your effects in Python, VB, c -sharp for Unity, or pretty much any language that can create an array and talk over a network socket. I have a sample project included that can be compiled to run on Mac, Linux, or Raspberry Pi. In fact, it's a single Raspberry Pi that runs all of the LED effects that you see around Dave's Garage Studio. Night Driver is fully open source on GitHub and completely free for non-commercial use. Check the copying.txt file in the repo for the full details. I've been working on Night Driver for about three years in my spare time. It's been a labor of love and a great education for me, and I initially assumed I would build some kind of commercial project out of it. But the success of the Software Drag Racing Series Primes project on GitHub took me by surprise. After I uploaded my Prime Civ in the initial three languages, Helpful Strangers ultimately ported that code to a total of more than 80 computer languages. I didn't even know there were 80 compilers. That led me to the belief that, simply put, I'd have a lot more fun and people would get more use out of my work if I just released it open source. And so, at the last minute, I relented and I convinced one of the dedicated GitHub admins of the Primes project to administer the Night Driver project as well. When Rutger accepted way over in the Netherlands, I knew the project would be in good hands. But how did I come to spend all this time tinkering with LED control software and why? Well, it all started about three years ago when I was working out here alone in my shop. This is a full automotive shop as well as a software den and I was under the dashboard of my 69 Pontiac working on the headlight harness. I was upside down under the dash with my feet literally sticking out the window. I couldn't really see very well and so to reach the spot I needed I kept turning my neck a little further, a little further, a little further and then pow! I blew the disc out between my C5 and C6 vertebrae. You can bet it was more than a little painful and suffice to say that alone and upside down under the dash with your feet out the window is not the place you want to be when you suffer an injury like that. 
I really wanted to avoid surgery, so I decided to try the rest and rehab approach along with physical therapy. I stuck it out for about six months before finally accepting that surgery was going to be inevitable for me. Thus, I had a spinal laminectomy, which is the removal of the back portion of one of the vertebrae. Ow. This takes pressure off the cord and gives them better access to clean up the debris from the destroyed disc. For reasons I never fully understood, despite asking, they don't put the piece back. But long story short, it was a success, and other than a cool scar and a missing piece of neck vertebrae that kind of feels really weird when you press on it, I was on the path to recovery. Most of this time, I was pretty much sofa-bound, sitting propped up with a bunch of pillows to support my massive head. I vowed not to waste the time binge-watching on Netflix. I couldn't code at my desk as normal, though, and so I grabbed a laptop and I discovered electronics tutorials on YouTube. Channels like Great Scott became indispensable as I decided that I was going to learn some electronics, an area that I thought I had been traditionally weak in. I found I could code at my sofa for quite a long while and then walk out to the shop and upload the code to the Arduino test it, debug it, and then return back to the sofa. As the days and weeks progressed, the length of time that I could spend out in the shop grew little by little. My first circuits were to blink a single LED, which I soon upgraded to an RGB LED. I experimented with transistors and pulse width modulation in order to control the colors of the LEDs, and that's when I discovered individually addressable LEDs, by which I specifically mean those called WS2812B LEDs. They're usually sold in long strips, although circles and matrices and other formats are available, and the density of the strips is usually 60 or 144 pixels per meter. Each pixel is actually three little LEDs, consisting of a red, a green, and a blue. There's also a tiny little simple microcontroller embedded in each pixel. Its job is to receive, use, and then pass along a square wave data signal that is sent along the single extra wire, which is the data line. So you simply have 5 volts, ground, and data. By sending the correct data to the LED, you can control its color across the entire 24-bit spectrum. If that sounds like it might be a little complicated to do, rest assured that even though it's a super basic protocol, you still don't need to know anything about it. It's all handled by NightDriver, which in turn uses a library known as FastLED behind the scenes. FastLED uses special pins on the ESP32 known as RMT pins. They were initially intended for things like generating the data signal needed for infrared remote controls and FastLED uses them to send out the data signal needed to control the colors of each LED. The protocol is fast enough that you can update the 24-bit color of about 1,000 LEDs up to around 24 times a second, and it can do it on 8 channels or pins in parallel. Shorter runs of LEDs allow for much faster frame rates up to about 240 frames per second. In addition to strips, NightDriver can control and draw into matrices as well. Now here's an example of a spectrum analyzer I wrote that is provided as one of the demo configurations for NightDriver. It's a 48 by 16 matrix of very bright LEDs and the microphone is used to build the spectrum analysis which in turn is then visualized in a number of different effects. Here's an example of the basic spectrum analyzer and if we use the remote control we can step through the other palettes as well as this patriotic flag effect. There are also effects such as this sound wave effect which scrolls the current sound waveform out from the center. Just like with strips, NightDriver can receive and process the color data to be displayed on a matrix by Wi-Fi as well. Here's an example of video being sent to a simple NightDriver setup. I had to set the frame rate very low to get it to video properly with the camera, but it can run at a full 60 frames per second if needed. Best of all, the number of smaller matrices that can be combined is limited really only by your Wi-Fi bandwidth, and everything is compressed, and each panel is perfectly synchronized via NTP. Each NightDriver client buffers frames in memory for about a second, and that means that you could build a giant jumbotron out of many smaller panels. They don't even need to be interconnected in any way. To get started today, though, we're just going to wire up an LED strip, connect it to the ESP32, compile the NightDriver code, upload it to the chip, and then marvel at the beautiful marquee effect that it draws by default. From there, we'll later explore how to configure the project for more complicated setups, how to select from the many built-in effects, and even how to write your own new effects that run both locally and remotely. I think my dog is snoring. Sorry if you can hear that. About the only thing that you need to install is the Git source code control program and a copy of Visual Studio Code set up with a platform I.O. extension. Everything works equally well on Linux, Windows, or Mac. I've made a separate video on installing platform I.O., and I'll try to add a few handy links to even simpler setup articles in the video description. Once you have Git installed, you can download the NightDriver source code. To do so, go to your source code folder of choice, and locally of course, and do a git clone of the project from GitHub. 
You can get the URL to clone by visiting the GitHub page for the project and selecting it from the code dropdown. Copy the path to the clipboard so that you can use it and paste it into the console. These instructions are available in the video description and probably are much easier to follow in text. Assuming you've got Visual Studio Code installed, you should be able to simply then type code night driver strip and that will bring up the project in the IDE. If it asks you if you want to load the workspace file for the project, go ahead and say yes. We'll explore this project in much, much more detail soon, but for now, let's just go ahead and naively build it. To do so, find the source folder and open the main.cpp file within it. Press Ctrl Shift P or F1 or whatever the Visual Studio Code menu hotkey is on your platform and type build without pressing enter. That should narrow your choices down to where you can just select platform IO build. It's set up such that not only will it download the Arduino platform for you, but also all of the ESP32, tools, headers, libs, compilers, and everything it needs. It will also automatically download all of the libraries that Nightdriver is internally dependent on. Properly installed, everything should just build with ease. If it doesn't, or if you require other assistance, please start with the discussion section on the Nightdriver GitHub project for assistance. Don't open an actual issue against the code unless there's a bug in the code. Next, we need to upload the code to the ESP32. I'm going to connect it to a USB port and then check which serial port it wound up getting connected to in Device Manager. Then I simply need to update the platformio.ini file with that COM port. Once done, I can select platformio upload and the code will be uploaded and flashed to the chip automatically. If you didn't specify a COM port, it will do its best to figure out what port to use automatically. Now we need to connect something to the chip for this to work of course, and that something is an LED strip. I'm going to cheat a little here for simplicity and wire my strip directly to the ground, 5 volts, and pin 5 of the ESP32 module. Pin 5 being the default data pin used by the night driver code to talk to your LED strip. You need to be careful with this configuration though because you're powering everything off the USB port and through the module's onboard regulator, so it would be very easy to overload things with too many LEDs or too bright of a pattern. Later, we'll do things more correctly by providing a separate power supply for the LEDs, but this is just a quick test. Proceed at your own risk and consult a knowledgeable friend or expert if you have any doubts before you connect anything to your PC. In fact, even then, it would still be much smarter and safer to power it from a small USB wall adapter than from your prized gaming rig, for example. Once connected, we can power it up and if everything went according to plan, we get a cool little LED test pattern on the strip. They say every journey of a thousand miles starts with a single LED, and I guess it's that first one there. I want to use the time remaining to at least get our feet wet in the code. The project itself is organized pretty simply. There's a root folder and it contains project-wide files, a source code folder named SRC that contains the CPP files, and a data folder that includes static content like HTML and images that get uploaded to the chip. There's also an include folder that includes the header files. There are three files that you will be interacting with the most initially. The first is platformio.ini in the root, which is very much like the project's makefile for platformio. Next is global.h, the file that, where you define things like how many LEDs are connected and what pin they're connected to and so on. The third is main.cpp, which includes the chip startup and main loop code. Let's start with platformio.ini. If you're new to platform.io, it's going to look a little cryptic at first, but it's just a windows style any file with name value pairs grouped into sections. And the first section is the platform.io section itself. A platform.io project can define multiple target environments, or you might only have a single one for a simple project. Nightdriver does have several, each of which corresponds to a project that can be built with the code. For example, to build a simple demo project, you set the default environment to be demo. It will then read its additional options from the demo section of this file. We also define the data directory here, which is simply a folder that contains static content like HTML and images that will be uploaded to the chip's file system storage for certain projects that require it, like the web server. The ENV section defines that which is common to all of the targets. In our case, that includes the platform and framework, which is ESP32 Arduino. We are building a debug build and we undefined the default build flag of C11 compatibility as we actually need C17. Next come the libdeps, which is a list of the project that this target is dependent on. It's actually really cool because you can link just directly to an entire GitHub project just by putting it in a line here. M5 stick, for example, is the set of includes and lib needed to run code on an M5 stick. We also include functionality such as TCPIP, remote debugging, a few graphics libraries for good measure, and so on. 
Individual targets can override things defined in the comment section, but I haven't figured a way to simply add to them. That means if a target like demo needs a single additional library, it has to provide the entire list of libs fresh again in its section. If you know a way to avoid that duplication, please let me know in a comment or just go to GitHub and fix it for me. In each target section, we define things such as which ESP32 chip module is being used. We also define the upload serial port and what baud rate. I think it's interesting that you can run the M5-stick-C at least up to 1.5 million bits per second. It's a long way from the days of 9600 baud. Each target defines build flags as well, and each will define a unique pound-defined value, such as demo equals 1 for the demo project. That definition gets passed to the compiler, and the header files will then make use of it. That definition will have its impacts primarily in the globals.h file. Within that header is a large if-then-else section that defines all of the project variables based on which build target was selected in Platform.io. Let's take a look at the definitions for the demo project. For consistency, I define a strip as being a matrix of pixels that is only one pixel high. If it's a 144 LED strip, the width is thus 144 and the height is 1, and that's what we see defined here. Num LEDs is perhaps the most frequently used definition in the project, as it represents the total count of LEDs being controlled. The demo project uses a single pin to run a single strip, and so we define the number of channels to be 1. A channel is simply a strip or matrix connected to a pin. The ESP32 can do up to 8 in parallel. This code can handle more if you have the pins available, but they'll be done in batches of 8 at a time. LED pin 0 is the pin number for channel 0. It's set to pin 5, and the data wire for our LED strip is connected to that pin. The power limit attempts to limit current consumption of your strip to the limit you specify in milliwatts, which is actually power, so it's limiting the power, not the current. When it's about to draw, a calculation is made as to how much power will be required to display the requested pattern on the LEDs at the specified brightness. If it exceeds the power limit, the brightness of the entire strip is scaled down linearly in an attempt to fit it within that limit. It's not a replacement for fuses or good hardware design, but it's helpful. Next, we find a section where various major features of Night Driver can be selectively enabled or disabled. In most cases, this will also cause the code related to that feature to be excluded from compilation, thereby saving memory space. Note well that these are compile time definitions, so if you build a project without the web server, it can't be later turned on at runtime. It must be built with it included. Enable Wi-Fi does what you would expect. It turns on the Wi-Fi client and attempts to connect to your network using the SSID and password that you define in globals.h. I'm also in the process of enabling Wi-Fi manager support so that the end user can configure the Wi-Fi for themselves at runtime in the browser rather than baking everything in at compile time. It just wasn't quite working at the time I made this video, so stick with the hard-coded credentials until that work is complete. The definition for incoming Wi-Fi enabled controls whether or not a socket server is opened on port 49152. That server receives color data over Wi-Fi, buffers it, and displays it preferentially whenever there is a stream of incoming color data to draw. Time before local defines how long, in seconds, the system will go without Wi-Fi data before falling back to draw built-in effects. Let's say you build a system for your restaurant where each table has an LED candle centerpiece. The built-in effect is a flickering candle, but you can send a Wi-Fi effect from the kitchen whenever you wish. This definition controls how long it will wait for the Wi-Fi color data before going back to the internal candle effect. Enable NTP is optional but highly desired for the case of streaming color data. NTP is the protocol that keeps the server and the client in time sync so that, for example, your Python code on the PC can send color data to your ESP32 Christmas tree and they'll both have the same view of the clock and it will show the right bits at the right time. It's not horrible if you don't, but it's much better and more seamless if you do have the clock synchronized. Right now, I believe the NTP server might actually be hard-coded in this code, so double-check that to make sure it's right for your network. If you don't have an NTP server handy on your network, you can use time.google.com by pinging it to figure out what the IP is and then using that IP instead. Enable OTA only makes sense when Wi-Fi is enabled because it's what enables over-the-air updates to the flash memory. When it's turned on, you can upload to the ESP32 over Wi-Fi right from Visual Studio Code. You simply change the COM port in platformio.ini to be the chip's Wi-Fi IP instead, and presto magico, you can update live over Wi-Fi instead of dragging out a serial cable every time you want to update your project. Enable Web Server turns on a complete async web server running right on the ESP32. That web server gives you a basic user interface for selecting amongst built-in effects, and it provides the fundamentals of a JSON-based REST API that any client can access to enumerate and change effects. It's not very fleshed out yet, but the bones are there. 
For it to work, however, you'll have to upload the SPIF's file system data, which includes the HTML, JavaScript, and images needed. We'll do that in an upcoming episode when we enable the web server. In future installments, I won't need to have the introductory preamble and explanation and demo, so I'll be able to focus a lot more on the code itself. In the next episode, we'll jump right into main.cpp for a headfirst dive into the code to see how it all works. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss it. If you're interested in the LED and C++ programming side of things, please be sure to give this episode a like so that the algorithm and I both know that you actually enjoyed it. I'll put links to all the parts you need in the video description, where you'll also find handy links to platform IO setup information, links to the GitHub source code, and everything else you need to get going. Order the parts you need now so that you have them to follow along with the episodes as they are released. In the meantime, and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.